I'm your host, Peter Komandowski, and welcome to Surviving Dad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration. Today, we talk about parenting when a child's life falls apart. Linda, her husband and son survived what she called pure hell when cannabis-induced psychosis tore apart their lives. When marijuana pushed their son into crisis, Linda and her husband were not prepared for what came next. She joins us today to share her story in the hope that parents with children that use marijuana are prepared for the possible dangerous consequences their families may face. Linda, I thank you so much for joining us today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how your story started. Well, um, we uh, went through a horrible ordeal and we had no idea you know, what was happening, why it was happening. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go through what my testimony kind of is and what happened. Um, so our son, Kobe, who's 21 now, has had two very serious cannabis-induced psychotic breaks in the last two years. As Kobe was growing, growing up, he was playing soccer and hockey and tennis. He's, we spent time together at the family, with the family at the lake house in the summers. He never had any trouble in school. He didn't have any trouble with the law. He was really doing pretty good. He was uh, a, the sheriff's cadet and was looking into law enforcement. Um, in high school, things seemed to change and he began spending huge amounts of time online playing games. Uh, he's, it seemed to suck him into his room and he became isolated. And looking back now, I see that he probably started smoking weed around his sophomore year of high school. When, and that's when his grades got really bad um, and even worse during his junior and senior years of high school. So he made it through high school. The first semester of college, he was a little depressed and had anxiety maybe we thought, but then he totally flunked out of his classes. He was living in the dorms. You know, we had, we had put him in the dorms, paid for his school. We didn't realize that he was not going to any classes and he was smoking weed every day. Then he, but somehow he got a marijuana card um, and that's when things got super weird with him. And I think he might've gotten a marijuana card before college. Um, and he uh, was arguing all the time and, and he was, uh, he was acting, acting out. Um, his friends would call us and we'd have to drive him home because he was acting strangely from someplace. Um, he left our house one night when we got into an argument. This was all during that time when we didn't realize what was happening to him. Um, and we, uh, and the next day, my husband was driving home from work and on his way home from work, Kobe was standing in front of a homeless shelter. Um, he came home and told me, and I immediately drove down and found him. He was completely out of his mind. He was delusional and talking about, um, he, he was talking about being sent there by God. He had, um, he had been walking in and out of businesses, acting weird and strangely darting in and out of traffic. He had six interactions with law enforcement that day. So, um, so he, you know, we, we got him to the hospital. Um, we, we, I called the police and we ended up getting him to the hospital that day. That was his first psychotic break. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, after the hospital, uh, you know, fast forward eight months, we, you know, you would never think smoke, he would smoke cannabis again. Um, and he started smoking, he started smoking weed again. Um, he, he got, you know, he got, I could tell that psychosis was kind of coming. It was acting like that same thing. Um, he somehow got acquainted with a 45 year old guy after I had kicked him out of the duplex that he was living in. This, this guy had convinced him, um, to drive down to California with him. And Kobe had enough money from a tax refund in his job that he had quit. <laughs> to uh, spend all of his money on this. Um, uh, so he went down to California. Um, he told us he was, uh, on the rare occasions that we answered, that he answered the phone, he would tell us, he wouldn't tell us exactly where he was, but we understand he went to Seattle, Portland and California. He was tased at a homeless camp when they stayed in one of the Antifa camps. He slept by a dumpster. He, um, and the man he was traveling with ended up stealing everything from him. Um, you know, we would call him intermediately, intermittently, but we, we never knew for sure where he was. Um, finally, because I, I, re, uh, reported him as a missing person. 
Um, I had called the California police and told them what was going on. And they finally, um, this all happened within a two week period. So finally, a, a sheriff's deputy called me about four o'clock in the morning and said, we have Kobe on the side of the road and he's trying to get into a casino. You need to come and get him. And this was outside of Sacramento. And I knew that we couldn't just go get him. I told him, I begged and pleaded with him to get him to a hospital. And the guy knew what I was talking about and he was a really good law enforcement officer. And I will just, you know, always be thankful because he did, he, he knew and he said, okay. And it wasn't easy for him to do, but he got him into the psychiatric hospital again. And he spent another, another three weeks there. Well, we're going to take a short break. We come back. We're going to talk about not just what happened, but maybe even go back to those early times in high school when you started noticing something was wrong. We'll see y'all after the break. You don't want to miss this. The black truck. Hey, Christina from accounting. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, I used to date a girl named Christina. Oh, really? Yeah, and then she dumped me for my best friend. You want to see some photos of them that I took? I don't. I thought we talked about this, buddy. Buzz and overshared again? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call a car. That's a smart idea. So Yeah, I know. That's why I did it. Hey, you're going to get back to the top of the mountain. Does that mean I'm going to get back with Christina? No. Oh. No, no. Every second, 127 new devices connect to the internet. You can feel it happening. Our digital world expanding with every breath. We're entering a whole new era of connectivity, and Mediacom will be ready to power it. With one of the nation's first 10G platforms, we'll be bringing you more speed, more capacity, more security, and the power to do more than you ever dreamed possible. Welcome back to Surviving Bad. I'm your host, Peter Komandowski. And we're talking about the scary consequences of youth marijuana use that seldom is talked about. Psychosis and psychotic breaks that can thrust a family into turmoil. Linda, tell us what happened. So um, when, when he was in the hospital in California, I knew what, to, uh, what he needed to take because of the previous time he was in the hospital. So I called them and I told them what medications worked because they do need medication when they're in a psychosis. So they did, that helped a lot. And they, they gave him that medication. And it took about three weeks before he stabilized from that psychosis. And we drove down and picked him up. And we drove back to Montana and, you know, hoping that everything was going to work out. <laughs> that must have been some drive back home. It was terrible. Yeah, it was it was a 14 hour drive and he was still, um, you know, we couldn't fly because we didn't want something him to act weird or something happen on a plane. So we drove and he was still acting pretty weird. And it was hard. It was, it was hard. But um, it takes a long time for that to, to stabilize. How long had he been gone from home at that time? About two weeks before okay. uh, before he got into the hospital. So you get him back home, then what happens? So, um, you know, you don't think <laughs> they're ever going to smoke weed again. You get, you can't even imagine. Um, so he did try to start, he did smoke weed again about another, another eight months. He just did not want to believe that weed was going to do that to him. He had people telling him that it wasn't the weed, it wasn't that. It, and so he started smoking weed again. Um, and in that, that time, when I noticed he was becoming psychotic or acting weird, because it does happen again and again, after they've had their first psychotic break from weed, it will happen again. It's just, it will. So um, I kind of knew what to do this time. And I, I know, I knew how it was, I knew how to get around getting the police to get him to the hospital, because that's a whole other story that you have, it's hard to do. Um, so I did that. And I mean, it, it's like calling the police over and over and over and kind of building a case almost to get in, involuntarily committed. So we did it again. And that time, this time, 
was the last that, that Gary and I were gonna, uh, you know, mess around anymore. We were really serious about getting, and our, our whole family was, we were serious about getting help and figuring out how to do it the right way with help through, with our whole family involved and counseling and everything. And he had boundaries this time, big boundaries. And he, um, he was scared this time because I think he realized he really does, it really is from, from weed and it really is bad. Yeah, he didn't realize it was addictive. But the other side of the coin is he probably never realized how much it affected the mental health of your family, you and your husband. It put oh, you know. under a tremendous amount of stress. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah, it was it was really hard. Hardest thing that either one of us have ever gone through. And, uh, you know, it's we we're not I mean, I have a bail bonds business and my husband is an attorney and we know about drug cases. You know, we know what drugs do to people. We understand drugs are bad and drugs hurt. They make people crazy. We didn't know weed. We didn't know that weed would do this. We didn't, we, we couldn't believe it when they first told us the first psychotic break that he had, that it was cannabis induced psychosis. So he, he started out as a great kid. I mean, it really, there were no signs. He wasn't a troublemaker when he was young. Um, what you, you talked about finding him more alone in his room. Um, yeah. Was it a lack of friends? Was it the COVID thing? I mean, what happened that really drove him into that sort of isolation? I think that it was the COVID thing, part of it. And I think another part of it was once you start to smoke weed, they become like that. And it's like he just wanted to play video games and, and just sort of be in his room. And, and then that just led to more downward spiral, you know, the video games and being isolated isn't good. And yeah, so and nobody nobody thought about the mental health side of a psychotic break, which would make it dangerous for him and for you. Yeah, it, it it's awful. It's awful for everyone. So going back now, you have him in Montana. You have some boundaries. What happened from that point on? So we got help for six for six months. We did a, a really intensive treatment plan with a, a, like a group of, of this team of people that we would do Zoom with and, and meet with. And he had a doctor um, and this, this team was almost like a life coach for him. And we just went through all of the, uh, the boundaries with him. He signed a contract and I realized that I was being, I had been codependent, didn't think I was, you know, never realizing that I could ever be codependent, but I, I kind of knew that I wasn't going to put up with, but you are, you don't realize how codependent you really are. And yeah. So that's you know, we're going to take another break and, and we're going to continue to talk about how, fa how families can cope and survive these things and talk about not only how well things are going now, but some of the key things you've learned that other parents need to hear. See you all after the break. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. What? Why? My. Oh. <laughs> no, you can't. Every second, 127 new devices connect to the internet. You can feel it happening. Our digital world expanding with every breath. We're entering a whole new era of connectivity and Mediacom will be ready to power it. With one of the nation's first 10G platforms, we'll be bringing you more speed, more capacity, more security, and the power to do more than you ever dreamed possible. Welcome back to Surviving Bad. We're with Linda. Her son was caught unsuspecting of the risks associated with marijuana use. And together, they've learned a lot of lessons that Linda hopes you can avoid. Now, Linda, you and your husband went through hell for over two years. And thankfully, now your son is doing good, right? 
Yeah, he is. Mm -hmm. But you've learned some things. I mean, if if you knew what marijuana could do to a kid in high school, I imagine the advice you'd give to parents is different than what you did, because not everybody realizes what it can do to a child's mind. Yeah. Now, what so, would you tell a parent? I mean, when they're dealing with kids where, that are trying to tell them that, you know, marijuana is all right, it's not going to hurt me, it's not addicting. You know, it's it's such a, uh, it's just such a, a slippery slope because there are kids that can smoke weed that doesn't hurt them like that. You know, it doesn't affect everybody like that. And I understand. But with the high THC levels that's, that are in the weed, especially in states that legalize it, they just keep just amping it up more and more and more and they get this high high thc level and then they vape it and if they vape it or they call doing dabs um smoking it or whatever it it really affects their brain more than it ever did before in the past so there's more and more kids that are um, affected by it um so the i've had calls from parents that have said their kids are acting weirdly and they don't really know what's going on and they're defiant and hard to get along with. And that's one of the signs. That's one of the things. And I always say, Did, are they smoking a lot of weed? Are they, are they, and they go, yeah, you know, is that, do you, you know, is that really what you think? And I'm like, yeah, I think it is. And you, you don't think it's going to hurt them, but it does. And it's addicting. So I wouldn't even mess around with it. I, I would, the first time that you realize something's weird and they're smoking weed, Pretty soon they're probably going to be smoking more of weed and they're going to be wanting more, more all the time and it's going to affect their grades. So just try to put those boundaries up, I would say, and, and just don't, you know, just use your leverage as a parent to, to put those boundaries up and not allow it because it can. You know, really now that your son, now that your son's clean and doing well, and I mean, very lucky to have parents that stuck with him through this whole process. What does he say about weed? Oh, he knows he knows that it's, it's affected him and he doesn't ever want to do it again. And he's scared that he might make a bad decision sometime and smoke weed. So he, he doesn't even drink too much because he's never had a problem with alcohol. He never really liked it, but he's afraid if he drank too much someday or some night, he, he might smoke weed again. So he's scared to, to like make that bad decision. So he's trying really hard, you know, to put up, he's, he's doing, Great. He's gone to meetings. He talks to people who are uh, who have been through this. He's going to start back in school this fall, um, and he wants to be a uh, psychiatric RA. It sounds like you have a lot of conversations with him about these experiences. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, we do. What have you learned from those conversations now that he's on the other side of this problem? Um. Well, I, I'm just finally starting to kind of trust that he's um, sincere about it <laughs> because he said he was sincere before and it was, he wasn't. And I guess those relapses of smoking weed can be normal and they call them a managed relapse when you, uh, when you know that there's, when you put your boundaries up and then they start smoking weed again and you, you go back and you re revamp the, the contract or whatever. But um, he, I can tell this time he's really sincere, and I, I think he, um, he, he wants to get back to where he was before his brain was assaulted by the, <laughs> these psychotic breaks, because it affects their brain, and it takes a while to get out of it, and it takes a, a while for them to get their memory going again, and it just, it's hard. Does he talk about some of the things that, that are missing since he, he's used? Um, you know, he lost all of his friends and he's got to redo that all, you know, that was tough and, and he, um, is making new friends and he, he likes the friends that he's got now who don't smoke weed and he, he's just starting over. It's kind of, it's starting over again and it's, it's hard. He lost everything that he owned three times in his life, three different times. He's lost two cars either given away or stolen and he lost all of his computers all of his uh everything he owned that were in the cars he lost and he he knows what he's lost and he what he can lose and it's it's sunk in 
but he never lost the love of his family and the hard work that you guys put in to stay by his side. No, no. All right, we're going to take a short break and we're going to invite Linda to share some final comments, insights, and inspiration for all of you parents out there that are watching and even kids if you're thinking about using marijuana. See you all after the break. You don't want to miss this. Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared and you can be certain we'll keep your world connected. Every second, 127 new devices connect to the internet. You can feel it happening. Our digital world expanding with every breath. We're entering a whole new era of connectivity and Mediacom will be ready to power it. With one of the nation's first 10G platforms, we'll be bringing you more speed, more capacity, more security, and the power to do more than you ever dreamed possible. Welcome back. Today on Surviving Bad, we're talking about surviving the consequences of marijuana use and psychosis, especially for family members. Let's see what insights our guest Linda has to share. Linda, I'm not going to say you weren't a great parent, but I'm asking for sake of other parents, if you could go back to when he was a sophomore and you say you sort of noticed that he was interested in like video games all the time and locked in his room, knowing what you know today, what would you have done differently? And what would you ask another parent to do if they find themselves in that place? Oh, yeah. Um, I definitely would have limited more of the screen time. And I wouldn't have believed all of his excuses. You know, what, well, everybody else is, you know, these guys are all my friends. And we're just, you know, and I wouldn't, uh, I would have known that, that if he was, when he would play games or sleep too much, have screens, either screens in front of his face or sleep too much, I would have um, taken him to a doctor then, and I would have started drug testing. And there's no, there, that, that's a great tool for parents is to drug test. In, in a, with Kobe, it was marijuana. It was only weed. It really was. And it was bad enough. You know, I mean, I, I don't, I, w I drug test him still. You know, and he that's part of our contract. So drug test them and take them to the doctor if you if you know something's weird and not don't let them be in the room playing games all the time. Well, and you know, though it sounds like playing games, it's also very much being alone. It's isolation, yeah. yeah and they like isolation. that. They, yeah, they want that. They 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 end up doing that. A lot now of as you re, as you're rebuilding your life, um, you 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 have faith together. You guys go to church together, so you you're now sort of rebuilding the family ties that maybe slipped away when he was a sophomore. Yeah, yeah, yep. That's pretty good. You know, I also know that you faced some problems helping him when he was over eighteen, because yeah. in a lot of cases he's an adult, and getting him into treatment or getting him into places is really really hard because the, the the you know public officials are going to tell you, hey, you can't do anything. He's an adult now. Yeah. How did you cope with that? That had to make you angry. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was a whole other hell that you go through when you have to get him involuntarily committed to a hospital. Because really that's what they have to be is committed to a hospital. And they're not gonna do it. They're not gonna go. And they don't, they don't Kobe thought he could uh he thought he could control the volcanoes in Yellowstone. And he was so out of touch with reality, but yet he could trick people into thinking he was just fine. And he could do that. It was the weirdest thing that he could, he could talk to the police and say, I don't know what's wrong with her, but I'm fine. You know, it's her. And so it was, uh, so you, you, I, you know, calling the police 19 times in a week and calling and calling because you know, something's wrong. They're out there wandering, no money, no, no cell phone, no clothes. They are just out there and they take off. And you got to keep calling the police and tell them they're a danger to themselves. You know, they have to be 
uh, either a danger to themselves or others in order for them to commit them, to take them to the hospital. And that's the, that's the tricky part. So you do have to keep calling the police and keep proving to them that they are a danger to themselves or that they could, if they did something to you, if they hit you or pushed you or something, but you have to get them into the hospital by calling the police, unfortunately. Yeah, and not every family survives intact when kids go through these problems. You pointed out two, two problems, isolation and video games and marijuana use, which are really, really big in this world. Now, if you're talking to another parent that's dealing with this, what advice are you going to give them? And the parent comes to you and says, you know, my kid's been playing a lot of video games and he smoked a little marijuana, but I guess it's not bad. What would your response be? Well, I guess if, if it's not bad for them, then they're not having any effects of it, of it. You know, if they if they see that their grades are fine and they're acting normal and fine and they're getting along with them, and then I guess it's not an issue. But for the parents that have the issue with the grades dropping, they're isolating in their room, they're talking back all the time. You know, they're smoking weed a lot, um, and they if they start acting weird, I would. I would just say that's a problem. And if you don't, it, it, if you just ignore it, it's just going to hurt them. It's going to hurt them. It's going to hurt their brain more. And the chances of, of like Kobe, he doesn't have uh, schizophrenia or bipolar. He is clear of, of mental health, those kind of conditions. He has anxiety, but, um, but psycho, uh, schizophrenia can be theirs to keep if they end up sometimes if they don't end up stopping if they continue to smoke weed every day all day long all the time it can lead to to schizophrenia and do they want their kid to have schizophrenia you know that that's something that would scare me and it did scare me well you know these are all great points and i thank you so much for sharing it's really brave to share these ideas because for a lot of people it's hard to talk about it and and many parents don't realize how dramatically challenging and dangerous the risk can be from something as innocent as either a game or something we, you know, that we've been taught to think that marijuana is not that dangerous. So thank you for joining us and thank you all for watching today. Check out our website at healthyiowa.org and keep your eye on Medicom MC22 for our next episode of Surviving Bad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration. On Medicom MC22, your local programming leader.